Our scripture text comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. For richer, for poorer. Those are words that we use often in vows that we take during wedding ceremonies. When we come to our Lord Jesus Christ and accept him to be our Savior and our Lord, we are also making a vow. a vow to be in relationship with him. As Jesus tells this story, it's not introduced as a parable, but we do treat it like one. It's not given as a detailed description of heaven or hell, but an illustration of two facts. One, the situation may be reversed in the life to come. The life that you experience here on earth may not be the same that you experience after life on earth. Two, the decisions made in this life are binding for the life to come. What we do today affects our future tomorrow. To really understand this story, we need to answer some questions. First, how did the rich man get into hell? What did he do to deserve hell? 
by being rich? He was, in fact, rich. He was well clothed. He was well fed. In those days, food was eaten with the hands, and they would wipe the hands clean on chunks of bread, and the bread was tossed to the dogs, perhaps even to Lazarus. Yet, it wasn't his wealth that sent him to hell. Was it by being immoral? There's no charge of immorality lodged against the rich man. He spent his life harmlessly enough, but he did nobody any good. He did not love. His immorality does not appear to have sent him to hell. Was it by ignoring a man? Perhaps he had given Lazarus breadcrumbs from his table, but it seems he never really noticed him. Lazarus was hungry. He was a harmless, helpless man. He wasn't mistreating anyone. The rich man had ready opportunity to help somebody. This is the only charge lodged against the rich man. Second question. What was hell like? The answer is mercifully brief. Two characteristics are very clear. The first one is it was torment. The rich man was being tormented. The contrast is very sharp. Lazarus was taken up by angels, and the rich man was buried. He was tormented by the sight of Lazarus. You might ask, how can that be? How can that be? Well, maybe he was tormented by the memory of his better life on earth. If only he could have had a vision of the future. The second characteristic is that it was separation. Hell was separated from both God and the good. A great gulf was fixed. Even as the rich man in life had fixed a great gulf between himself and Lazarus. I know we often do things like that in our own lives. We look at people and make judgments on them, of their status in life. They're beneath us, or they're above us, or whatever the case may be. The rich man didn't associate with Lazarus. It created a gulf between them. Every time he walked past Lazarus, the gulf got wider. Every time Lazarus refused to be embittered by it, the gulf became even wider. The next question to answer, was there any hope for the rich man? Did he have any hope? This answer is simple also. There was none whatsoever, no hope. His destiny was sealed. At death, the last chance for eternal life had faded, it was gone. The rich man had had it. He had everything. He 
He had had the opportunity. But the opportunities had been exhausted in his flesh and blood experience. They were gone. This is a sad illustration of too little, too late. It was too late to call to Abraham. He should have done that years before. It was too late to notice Lazarus. But notice that even here, he spoke of Lazarus as if he were a servant. He says, Abraham, send Lazarus to me. It was too late to think about his five brothers. He should have thought about them earlier. It was too late to talk about the resurrection. He had passed beyond the veil of resurrection. Jesus said, the last shall be first. The first shall be last. This is the principle that Jesus laid down. God's values reversed the social order. Lazarus was now on the right side of the gulf, and the rich man was begging. The parable starts. A certain beggar. Who's the beggar? Who is the beggar? What happens to a person when he dies? It's a pretty important question. I think all of us in our more serious moments want to know the answer. In a book called Children's Letters to God, a little boy named Mike wrote, Dear God, what happens when you die? Nobody will talk to me about it. I don't want to do it. I just want to know. Where do you go for answers to questions like that? I'm convinced that there's only one reliable place, the Word of God. And that's why we look at this story to help us understand about the future that faces us all. And it does face us all. We've all heard it said there are two things that are certain in life, taxes and death. We all have to face it unless Jesus Christ returns before we have to face it. But that still doesn't rule out the fact that we have to decide in this life. We have to make the decision in this life that affects our future. And you do get to decide a lot of things in life, but there are three choices that you don't have any decision in about at all. You can't make the choice. Not just death and taxes. There are three things that you can't decide on. First, you don't get to choose to be born. That's not your choice. Second, you don't get to choose if you will die or not. That's not your choice. It's going to happen. And third, you don't get to choose whether you will exist beyond the grave or not. The Bible is clear that you do, and this parable teaches us that you do. It's not your choice whether it happens or not. There is one element that in this equation that you do get to choose. You get to make the choice about where you will spend eternity. A very important choice to make. Our scripture text provides some of the information we need to make an informed choice. And we all want to make informed choices in life. We need to 
note some things that are not taught in this parable. First, this parable does not teach, you, teach us that riches are bad. It doesn't say that. It does not teach us that poverty is good. It doesn't say that. We do know from Jesus' other teachings that riches carry risks. If you've got money, sometimes it's harder to worship God. But on the other hand, poverty isn't a virtue. Neither riches nor the lack of them saves you. Only trust in Jesus Christ alone. Second, the parable does not teach that extending charity to the needy saves us. Just because we help other people, that's not our salvation either. Followers of Jesus ought to be generous and compassionate in every way. But you have to understand that that's the result of relationship to Jesus, not the cause. Third, this parable is not a detailed road map to the afterlife, even though some have tried to use it that way. Many Bible scholars believe that Jesus' story follows the outline of many similar stories that were familiar to the people of his day. So he uses a common story and adds a new twist. Jesus was good at using common stories. Although it's not a road map to the hereafter, it does reveal some broad principles about the future. And these are certainties we can bank on. We can count on them. First, eternity is real. Whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, it's not your choice. Eternity is real. Every one of us will someday do business with death. Unless, as I said earlier, Christ returns first. We can pretend it isn't true. We can try to defy the aging process, which is so prevalent in our society today. But it does catch up with us one way or another. And when it does, we step into eternity. Simple as that. The second certainty you can bank on, the judgment is final. There's no do-over. There's no second chance. When the judgment comes and the judge has made his decision, it's final. It's over. Note how the great gulf is fixed. Once in eternity, it's sealed. Can't break the seal. The rich man regretted his decisions in life, but nothing could change that once he had crossed from life to death. Our life here on earth determines our eternal destiny. It's not a test. Life is real. It matters. So first, the first certainty, eternity is real. The second certainty, certainty, judgment is real. And the third is, hell is horrible. And heaven is marvelous beyond description. There are four things that happen after death. First, the spirit leaves the body. We are more than just a physical body. Death is not the end. Second, for the followers of Christ, death means entering the presence of the Lord. Paul could say confidently, to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5.8. Jesus told the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23, 43. Those who die in the Lord will wait with the Lord for the grand finale of history. Third, 
When Christ returns, we will receive our new resurrection bodies. The mortal will put on immortality. Disease, infirmity, and all the aches and pains of this life are going to be gone forever. We become as Jesus' body became. Finally, judgment will take place. Sin will be exposed for what it is. The godless will be sentenced to a godless eternity. Those who knew God through Christ will join the heavenly kingdom through what Christ did for them on the cross. Faithful servants will receive the faithful servant's reward. Note in the parable that the dead are very much alive. Both Lazarus and the rich man survived their own funerals. The dead retained their personalities and their essential character. Lazarus is still Lazarus, and the rich man is still the rich man. We think this is the land of the living, but it's really not. This is the land of the dying. Did you hear the one about the Pope, Billy Graham, and Oral Roberts all passing away on the same day and arriving at the pearly gates together? St. Peter greets them, and as he always does in make-believe stories like this, he says to the three religious leaders, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that we are full right now, and I'm going to have to send you, the three of you, down to the devil. The good news is that it should be temporary, and I'll have you back here in six weeks or less. St. Peter makes a quick call to Satan to arrange the necessary accommodations. Off the three go for a brief stay in hell. A week later, St. Peter receives an urgent call from demon headquarters. It's the devil himself. You have to get these guys out of here, and now! I mean, now! What's the problem, his saintliness queries? It's like this, the infernal one explains. The Pope is going around blessing everyone. Billy Graham is trying to save everyone. And Oral Roberts, he almost has enough money raised to put in air conditioning. We do joke about hell. But in reality, there's nothing funny about it. Perhaps our jokes are like whistling in the cemetery. As long as we laugh, as long as we make light of it, we don't have to think about the reality. In our text, the word that is translated hell in the NIV, NIV is Hades. That was a word or a term used to refer to the unseen world of the dead. It could mean anything from grave to death to hell, depending on the context. Here it clearly means the place of punishment reserved for the wicked, or hell. In the Bible, the Jews used the name of an actual geographic place, Gehenna, to refer to hell. Gehenna was the valley that ran along the city, southern city limits of Jerusalem. Hundreds of years before Jesus, idolatrous pagan temples stood there. Some involved human child sacrifice. When such practices were finally overthrown, the valley was considered so desecrated, so vile, that no one ever lived there again. It became the garbage pit and sewage lagoon of the city. Jerusalem dumped its raw sewage, burning trash, and rotting animal carcasses into that valley. In fact, when an especially vile crime was punished, the body of the executed would be thrown there rather than given a decent burial. When Jews talked of hell, the eternal torment of the wicked, they named it Gehenna, the worst possible thing they could think of. The Bible uses many other images to describe this reality. Lake of fire, burning furnace, outer darkness, bottomless pit. They're all intended to describe unimaginable torment and punishment. Some of these terms are mutually exclusive, like outer darkness and lake of fire. The image is symbolic. It is an attempt to picture in human terms and language the worst possible experience and destination you can imagine. The language may be symbolic, but the image is real. This brings us to our final certainty about the future. 
Believing these first three should make all the difference in the world. Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Did you notice the transformation of the rich man in the parable? The reality of hell created a desire to spare his brothers his fate. What do you suppose might happen to us and our church if we had that same kind of zeal to pray for the lost and make sure our friends and family knew how to avoid eternal judgment? Does it take a visit to hell? What should be our attitude when we think of hell? We should be consumed with humble gratitude. We should be so touched with the unmerited grace that God has shown toward us that we have absolutely no room left for self-righteous arrogance. From that should flow a deep, deep sadness. We must never speak of hell except with great remorse for the souls who will spend eternity there. Notice the real punchline of the parable. Jesus follows the basic outline of the common story told by many rabbis, but suddenly takes a new twist toward the end. That twist is the real punchline of the parable. The rich man wants a heavenly messenger to warn his brothers of what's ahead. Abraham turns down his request. Note the words that Jesus has him say. If they do not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even if someone returns from the dead. You already have your witness. You already have your testimony. You already have your prophecy. Even somebody returning from the dead isn't going to change people's minds if they've got their minds made up. God's word supplies us with all we need to know in order to avoid eternal destruction and eternal damnation. A person who doesn't believe God's written revelation will not believe a special revelation. If you are waiting for a miracle or some supernatural sign from heaven before you believe, guess what? You're wasting your time. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Little Mike, the person who asked the question in the, that we talked about, spoke for all of us when he said, what happens when a person dies? I don't want to do it. I just want to know. The fact is, we'll do it, ready or not. It's much better to be ready. Remember those three choices you don't get to make in life? You don't get to choose to be born, you don't get to choose to die, and you don't get to choose whether you exist after death or not. One choice that you do get to make, you get to choose where you will spend eternity. You make that choice when you choose to follow Jesus. That's a choice we all ought to make. We all all have to make it on our own. We can't have somebody else make the choice for us. It's not like having dinner prepared for us on the table. Yes, Christ is going to, is preparing a feast for us in eternity. But if we want to be at that feast, we have to decide during our life We have to make that choice to follow Jesus. This parable should remind us that apart from the grace of God, which is found in Jesus, we would all be facing the horrors that the rich man faced. That's our destiny. That's what we deserve. We deserve hell because of how we have disregarded God for most of our lives. That should be our fate. 
Jesus is the one who made it possible for you and I to walk in the halls of heaven rather than the horrors of hell. It's been a very quiet morning here this morning. And I'm sure I've given you a lot to think about. Talking about death is not an easy topic. But it is a reality. And it's something that each one of us needs to consider because we will all face it. And we will all face an eternal destiny.